thank you all for coming. And uh, I'd like to take a minute to introduce my wonderful speakers here. Um, I've known them longer than I admit I'm alive. <laughs> this is a lot. Anyway, um, I'll start with uh, Judith, who I knew as a student at the Media Lab when she was a student. And um, she's uh, both Judith and Michael have written uh, two amazing books, which are in the uh, lobby. Uh, anyway, so let me give you a quick introduction of Judith. Um, Judith Bonnet synthesizes knowledge from urban design, evolutionary biology, and cognitive science to design innovative interfaces for online communities and virtual identities. A Harvard Berkman faculty fellow and former director of the MIT Media Lab Sociable Media Group, she is known internationally for her writing on identity, interface design, and social communication. Her current uh, research focuses on how we signal identity in both mediated and face-to-face -face interactions. And she is working on a book about how the economics of honesty shape our world. Now, for a quick introduction on Michael, I've known Michael a long time, too. Um, Michael is a research fellow at the Sloan School Center for Digital Business, and his research is focused on the economics of innovation. On that note, I'll leave to you, can, you, can, you can say nice things about my book, too. I, I did say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, all right. Hello. So I'm going to give a sort of quick introduction to some ideas around online identity. And then we're going to have mo mostly discussion this evening. So but we'll start. Um, my husband's been sitting here telling me that I'm a Timer. So I'm going to just quickly get started, and we'll have plenty of time for discussion and questions. Um, the key difference, and it's a pretty obvious one, between online, between online society and our physical society is that we're embodied face to face. So if I'm an architect and I design a new building, I might change the atmosphere in a space. There are places that feel grand, there are places where you feel humble, there are places you feel bored, but they don't change the people. But when you're a designer of online sites and online applications, you're actually changing what people can see of each other, whether they're anonymous, whether you can see someone's face, whether you see their history, whether they have multiple identities. You change very fundamental things about how people are identified and how they can make impressions on each other. And so as a designer, a lot of the questions for affecting online social life really come down to what, what are the ways that you make identity manifest online. And so what I'm going to do is go through a kind of quick breeze-by history of identity in the online world. And we're going to start with in the 1970s with the sort of earliest social spaces were set up on the ARPANET, which was the military network, um, and this became a, a conversation center known as Usenet, where there were tons and tons of different topics of people talking about all kinds of things. But what's interesting from an identity perspective, this is showing what the entire mm. network was like. <laughs> and once they had a network of that size, they started having <coughs> discussions and issues around identity. But at that time, you were, you came into that network, you had access through an these older online conversations, you see the ways that people started trying to make something about their identity a little bit more vivid, a little bit more visual, a little bit more inter um, understandable. And one phenomenon was that in a lot of the news group discussions, people would always add a signature onto what they were saying. And part of what this did was it 
let them say a little bit about who they were. So this is a group called comp.security.unix. And so part of what you see are, um, here's someone who's putting their PGP key, their, their fingerprint numbers, their email address, all kinds of additional information about themselves so that one, it would make their letters and their contributions more visible. It would show sort of how they felt about particular things. And in the case of sort of effectively you know, say, here, here's my boss's phone number, it would give them that kind of authority that says, see, I really, really mean what I'm saying. I'm not like a, a fake fly by night identity. It was also interesting because you would start to see, even in this medium, that it was all text, you know, it's a very simple medium, the emergence of different societies in the different communities. So there was another male <coughs> group called uh, Rec Motorcycles, and this was usually for people who were pretty serious about motorcycles, but within the <laughs> community itself, they developed things like their own little motorcycle gang. So you see in a lot of these signatures that say DOD number four, or you know, DOD number 114, and that stood for Denizens of Doom. It was a completely virtual imaginary motorcycle gang. <coughs> but it's, yeah, it's another really important piece about identity, because it's not just about who you are as an individual, but a lot of what's interesting about identity is how you show your affiliation to others. And here, in a group like this, it would, it, if you see the number DOD 114 and you don't know what it is, it just seems like any other number. But for those initiated in that community, it would show, okay, I see the signature, I know they're in on the joke, they're one of us. And then even in groups that you would think might not have any space for this, for instance, the wedding news groups, people would, here's Karen, Mary Robert, do a date with no friends singing at the ceremony. This is you know, Rachel and Dave, where people just sign their, all of their letters with their engagement and their date. So you start to see, even in this like, simple text-based world, the emergence of the kinds of habits and mores that mark, and uh, rituals that mark a real community. This is a picture from a project that one of my students did um, with Mark Smith at Microsoft, looking at the Usenet news groups. And what was interesting here was she was interested in understanding the roles that were emerging in this time. And what you see here is um, different groups. Each of those dots is a different user. And um, as a visualization, what it shows is partly the importance of picking the right things to show. The higher up a dot is, it shows how long someone has been part of the group. The ones that are, and the further to the uh, right they are, it shows how many comments they make per particular conversation, per thread. And so the people who are way over here are very, very <coughs> engaged users. Just, just by way of context, how long does it take to develop a visualization like this? This, this took how long? Um, well, this, was, this probably took two months, three months. Back, um, back in? This is probably in the early 2000s. So it's a little later than the time we're talking about, but it's the same basic data. Um, and the interesting piece here is you can look at this and see that one over there where you have people who've been on it a long time, but there's almost everything is just a single posting. There's no engagement. That's just a group that was people just sending um, binary data, no conversation. Whereas you see something like this one, where there's a whole bunch of people who've commented over and over, is a group that had just sort of devolved into just arguments. Most other people have left, and those people would sit there and argue over and over. And so it's interesting, from seeing something like this, part of what we were interested in doing was being able to take, you don't know a ton about the identity of these people, but you can start to see, when you look at groups like that, by visualizing these people by just picking the right pieces of data, you start being able to see this kind of thumbprint of a community, and you have a glimpse in that way, the way that if you walk by a restaurant, you start looking when you think, wow, this place looks dead. I'm not going there. This is too crowded, or this is just right. To be able to start seeing through the behavior of the individuals so what might be an interesting place. We can call this inferential identity. You could. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so the decades go by. Now the world is becoming much, much more open. It's no longer just through institutional identities. Things like um, CompuServe were starting to open up to lots of people. And then by 1995, AOL had come along. I don't know how many of you remember using AOL, 
but it was a very, very different approach to identity because there they would say, here, here's six screen names. Come in and play around with who you are. Here's your opportunity to be a different person all the time. And so a lot of the online discussions, this is really changing the flavor of them as people got much more interested not in appearing as their real self, but that the net was this interesting opportunity to explore different identities. And another interesting part of it, too, is that this was the sort of heyday of the cyber utopian um, excitement about the net. Because if you look around a room, you know, here you are in a room, a couple of people you know, but a lot of people are strangers. But as soon as you see someone, the first things you notice are their race, their gender, their age. And a lot of times that will color how you hear what they're saying. So there's a tremendous amount of idealism then that here's this network, it's all text. This is a place where people will be heard based on their words, will, will have an impression of someone based on what they're saying without knowing all this other stuff about them. So this is, um, this is a text from The Mud, which was an online text-based role-playing game. So there's a lot of interest in this exploration of being able to have conversations with people all over the world without <coughs> knowing what their identity was. And the thought that maybe this is going to bring an entire new era into human communication. But part of the problem with this here is you know, a graphical version of it. This is something called the palace. The type of sort of graphical interface seems to rise about every seven years. Is that here you can say, OK, I'll be a teddy bear. I'll be myself. I will be a talking frog. Is that it turns out that if you, that while you can hide a lot of the markers of identity that permeate our society, that if you simply say, oh, well, you can call yourself something else, and then people will believe it, it doesn't make for a radically new society. It makes for a space with very cheap identities that don't really have any meaning. You just, you lose the significance of being something. It does, it's, to have actual change in how people act requires a much deeper understanding of how we form identity. Um, and just as a bit of context, <coughs> it's also important to remember that a lot of these ideas don't happen completely in a vacuum. So this is a book called Gender Trouble by Judith Butler, who was also writing around the early late 80s and early 90s. And she talked about how you know, gender is purely a construction. It's you know, basically a role that we play these roles in everyday life. So the net in the years before the web, where a lot of this identity <coughs> was coming, it wasn't simply that the tech, it happened that both the technology enabled people to play with identities in ways you couldn't face to face, but it was also occurring at a time when there was growing fascination about radically changing what, how we think about identity in society. So then, so all this is happening, and then in like 1993, Tim Berners-Lee develops the web. It becomes, you know, the net starts to take off. It's this amazing new place, lots of shopping and news and publication. In terms of social interaction, it was kind of a disaster. And it set a lot of sort of the sociability of the online world back, I, I think, you know, for, for quite a while. For, well, for one, if you look back at the early days of the web, um, <coughs> there's no, um, you could go to, you go to a web page, and if you go to another page, it actually took several years before the technology was developed that there was persistence of identity. And so if you had, you could put up all kinds of interesting discussions or pictures, but it was very, very difficult to have <coughs> people any kind of persistent identity, even if they wanted it. So what you had then was less sort of identity play, but just a interface where it was very, very easy to be completely anonymous. It's not the kind of anonymity that you want if you were to do something truly antisocial and have the FBI come after you. It's a traceable anonymity. But in terms of everyday social interaction, it meant that it was very, very difficult, for instance, to use the web initially to have any kind of conversation where you had something other than people just signing whatever name they wanted. And in those circumstances, a lot, you would just you started to have the problem of, of spam coming in. Um, and then there was also search, which is great for bringing up information. But what it also does is, under your real name, it starts to agglomerate all kinds of information together. So for instance, in the news groups that had existed, it, would, it meant that instead of having to be part of a community for a long time to participate, 
you look, you just find the information, so take that information out, not be a trusted member of that group. And so a lot of the existing online discussions kind of disappeared then. Around the early 1990s, I think in response to there being such a um, sort of easily faked identities on the web, there became a lot more interest in social network sites. And several were developed um, in the early 2000s, and then Facebook is sort of the obvious um, success right now with that. This is a map of all the connections in Facebook as of um, like five years ago. So this would be a much brighter map now. But this is if you just draw people's connections, you can sort of map out the world through Facebook. And this gives us sort of a completely different um, aspect of identity. Instead of it being sort of slippery and hard to get a handle on, <coughs> now the online identity that it predominates is this networked identity where it's you connected to a lot of people you know. Um, if you go to a news site that asks you to sign in under your, um, your name, you're commenting as not only your real self, but your real self very much connected to tons of people you know. So one of the big issues here is um, what we call context collapse. This is a map of my connections on Facebook as of a few years ago. And what you see is these are all it groups. It's a program that um, called Touchgraph that you just run on it. But it's sort of, it does a very nice job of grouping people. These are some people, you know, there's some people I know from graduate school. I can look at the name. There's people I know from undergraduates. There's people I know from the gym. There's people I know <laughs> from the mailing list. You know, sort of, there's people from me from high school. And they're all very separate. Things in real life, I, while I don't have a completely different identity, I'm Judith, don't ask to all of them, what I talk about with them is very different. The things, the jokes that we tell each other are very different. It makes for a very different context. By collapsing your context into these singular networks, it makes it very, very difficult to kind of maintain the <coughs> sort of separate facets that we're used to having in, in the face-to-face -face world, where you have, now you have to have this very, very singular identity. So that's kind of where we are today. Um, while at the same time that for a lot of us we have these networked identities that collapse context, there's still um, <coughs> very complicated issues with um, slippery identities. This is a story, this is for instance on Twitter, which is being used increasingly in sort of in the um, Arab Spring as a place where people get news and information. Um, they get it very quickly, where the identity of the person, as, especially as more and more people get their news from online sources like that, so you no longer have a known, reliable source. Um, what do you need to know about the identity of someone who tweeted something before you believe it, before you act on it? This was a very interesting case. There was a um, blogger who came out and said, you know, said this is, I'm, who identified herself as the gay girl in Damascus. She talked about what it was like day-to-day -day life in Beirut, what it meant to be a gay woman in this situation. And she had t lots of followers. They worried about her a lot. Um, then things started going really badly for her. People started calling you know, Human Rights Watch to try and help her out. And it turned out that she was actually Tom McMaster, a married man in Scotland, <laughs> who had been creating this fake blog for quite a long time. And the issue there was he, and <coughs> people were furious. I mean, part of it is it took away for a lot of the believability of people who should be believed, who really were there. But, you know, and it also meant that you had much more suspicion around that. People had acted on her information about who else was trustworthy, et cetera. And so it sort of shows the side that's very, very complicated about the online I identities um, when you're trying to get very serious news out of them. So for us, that a lot of the issues may be around sort of consumption of news and information, but there's a whole world that as your information is much more important, and it might be about your decisions about whether a particular part of the city is safe, or whether a particular leader is believable, understanding the identity of the people who are giving you that source of information becomes very key, and it's equally slippery online. So one solution I want to run by here, and then we'll open this to discussion, is, um, is the idea of saying, instead of having a, trying to use real names as sort of the locus of your identity, is that what you ha really should have is 
better means of understanding a particular identity's history. And it could be a pseudonym, but a pseudonym that builds up a history over time. Um, these are portraits that we, um, my students and I did. These are based on what people said on Twitter. And so here, for these particular ones, we have the words that you say on the right over time, what you're talking about currently on the left, and then you can sort of click on these and see them. But it's a way to get at like what a person has said over a long period of time much more easily. Um, I'm just going to leave it at that. Okay. Open up for questions. Um, well, I, I, I think <coughs> before I open, I'd like to follow up on, on, on okay. these things. And we'll have people kick in as, as the conversation progresses. Um, I, I, first off, fascinating synthesis. And I'm particularly impressed because you didn't mention your book in the entire time of this. And I will. I have a little picture of it yeah. at the end. But I find it's really a good idea. And I'll, I'll tell you, it's, 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 it's a very comprehensive, remarkable text. And, and as much as one can enjoy reading a text, I, I actually enjoyed it a great deal. And there's a particular theme in it, which you touched upon here, that I want to drill down on. You have in one of the chapters a discussion of the point you raised here about data portraits. Mm -hmm. You drew a very clear distinction between visualizations mm -hmm. and data <coughs> portraits. Mm -hmm. And you talked about the nature of portrait, everything from, from painting portraits to Avedon photos. Right. I'd like you to explain how your thinking evolved, because you showed earlier you know, visualizations of conversations. I'd like to, you to communicate, as both a researcher and somebody who oversaw research in this regard, how did your thinking evolve on visualization of identity versus a portrait of identity. Right. Well, there's two key differences. When you look at visualizations, they are really meant to show you some data. And they're meant to be as precise as that data is. Um, a portrait is quite different. It's, it's really formed by the tension between three people. There's the subject of the portrait who wants to be shown in as good a light as possible. And there's the audience who kind of wants to get some insight into that subject. What are they really like? And then there's the artist who may have a close relationship to the subject and might want to do exactly what they want. Um, they, they may want up their own reputation, et cetera. So it's the tension between those three that makes the portrait. And that's very, and the other thing is that the portrait is meant to be evocative of the subject. It's meant to be something that the viewer gets a feeling about them. It's not meant to be about like a precise set of data about them. Well, you set up this next question beautifully then, because the, the kind of portrait that most of the people in this room are familiar with, or certainly their children are familiar with, is the self-portrait, the selfie. Mm -hmm. And where, what have you discovered as people seek to portray themselves with scenes anonymously as part of a multiplicity of communities? How have you seen people change how they define, not just visualizing or conveying themselves, but self-portraits, the, the, the bandwidth of self-portraiture, the tools people use to create a self-portrait. People, now you can read about people taking, you know, how to take the perfect selfie for your LinkedIn or your Facebook page. How is your, when you were working in, in the media lab, we need to turn the mic down, the vibe down. Well, your tools were primitive in that regard. Now they're much more complex and complicated and value-added tools. How, how is that changing your perception of what it means to portray, self-portrayal in, in the community? Well, I think, I think you can also separate out very self-conscious portrayals from the kind of self-portrait that we are interested in, which is your history over time. And so if you're taking a picture of yourself, that's a fairly self-conscious one. But what's interesting there, if you, you know, for anyone who's looked at selfies online, is many of them are not amazingly flattering pictures. <laughs> um, one of the things that I find fascinating, there's a um, sociologist named Irving Goffman who's very influential on me. And he talked about the difference between the impression given and the impression given off. And what he meant by the impression given is the things that you, the way you would like others to see you and what you think you are, how, putting yourself out as. And the impression given off <coughs> is kind of what others can actually read through that. And so selfies have a 
enormous amount of that to them. But I think it's also any sort of singular thing like that always gives you a slightly skewed version. And that's why I've been so interested in history. And I really think that effectively your history is the equivalent of the body online. And it's that as you accumulate more history, each slice of which, each little selfie or data point may be inaccurate or skewed or unusual, but it's the accumulation of all of those over time that gives a very well-rounded portrait of you and that um, and may have <coughs> that what we want are the tools to let you develop that and keep some control over that. How do you portray yourself online? Very carefully. I mean, part of this, a, a lifetime of doing this as your career makes you incredibly self-conscious. And so I think part of what I think is very important for people to also understand is that you want, you want to, I mean, sort of the way that we think about getting dressed in the morning, in some ways I think we will become conscious of having a public self online and hopefully a series of private selves. Right now, we're living in a world where we're increasingly pushed to have a very singular public self online, where everything you say should be under your real name. And that's fine for some things. But you know, here's a simple example. I do a lot of my shopping online. And so, and I like to read online reviews. It helps me buy clothes, it helps me go to restaurants, it helps me buy, you know, um, antibacterial facial scrub for my kids. And you know, I, it's good, it's nice that people have written all those reviews. But if I was going to say buy some foot powder, because I thought my feet were smelly, and I bought it, and it didn't work, and I decided to write a scathing review about it, that's not really what I want to come up when people Google my name. <laughs> <laughs> well, I use this foot powder, and my feet like, still really smell. It, it you mean you, you, don't want, you don't want to be seen as an authentic critic in, in, in Yelp? I can live without being seen as an authentic critic of that particular thing. But that's something that is a useful contribution I can make. But as a, as the, in terms of the way we start to think about how we present ourselves online, I think those are some of the things you might think, you know, I may have a pseudonym that does drugstore.com reviews, or I might talk about other things. Or maybe, especially, I think there's there are still a lot of gender. Let me just ask a question to the audience. How many of the people in this audience have more than three identities online? How many of you find this easy to manage? Last question on that. How many of you have an identity, an identity manager for this? Sir? I did? Yeah. Does it work for you? Yeah. Yeah, because I built it. You built it. <laughs> and what's the most important thing this audience should know about the value of that identity manager that you built and how it makes your life easier? Or excuse me, managing your multiple lives easier? Uh, well, the easiest thing it allows me to do is it allows me to segment my relationships and communications with everything I do online so that I can easily shut them off when they cease to be them. Do you, do you think that, you know, I look at a self-portrait as being as much about an aesthetic as anything else. The definition that you've heard here is, and what you're talking about here with, with your reviews is, the portrait is much being functional as aesthetic. Mm -hmm. One of the intriguing things about the media lab is that there's always been a balance between function and aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Where do you draw a line in a portrait between the, the kind of explicit functionality, segment, segregate, not communicate, power of choice, versus conveying affect as well as effect? Well, part of the function is to convey affect. I mean, if you look at the history of portraiture, they weren't always just sort of purely decorative things that you put on the wall. Um, you know, the famous example being, you know, um, Henry VIII, who married, now just based on the name of which queen he married, because there, there were six of them. But, you know, one of his <laughs> wives... Henry would probably died anyway, so... Well, you're, you're she did die, this. but, I mean, eventually she did. But, you know, one of his wives, he married on the basis of having only seen her portrait. Um, and it's an interesting example, because the portrait artist, Holbein, had gone to paint her at her father's castle. 
And apparently she was fairly homely, but he was he was in this fairly powerful man's castle. He couldn't actually paint the daughter as homely. So there he was under a lot of pressure to make her very beautiful, brings the portrait back. The king said, she's gorgeous. I'm going to marry her. And he was probably sitting there and thinking, this is not going to end well. And indeed, it did. he ended up in exile after that for some period of time. <laughs> <laughs> and he actually met the subject of the portrait. But I mean, the story is mainly that they've, they've often had, historically, a functional side. So the fact that they're only decorative <coughs> paintings now may be more the exception. Questions? Yes. Having multiple identities is a very personal thing. For me, it's like having a split personality. I, I would like you to yeah. answer that because I, I think back in this this era, you know, the 1990s and 2000s and the AOL thing, there was the discussion of would this lead to a fragmentation of identities? That the 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 professional you, the parental you, mm -hmm. the friend you, etc. That's the kind of question I would I would ask of, of you. Do you think that the kind of issues of pseudonyms and data portraits leads to a holistic view, or basically we fragment ourselves? We we deliberately cultivate tools to manage slices of ourselves, depending upon the situation that we're in. Well, I think that a lot of I mean it depends on the person, but I think a lot of it is really that. I'd like you to use yourself as an example. I think that we live lives that are, that are very <coughs> faceted, and so there are, it's just face to face, it's just much, much easier to maintain levels of everyday privacy. But that's and also facets, or like you have a diamond, it, but it's still a diamond, it's a right. facet of a diamond, but they're not fragments. Right. Why do you say facets and not fragments? Because I don't think it's about being, you, you could use these techniques to be extremely separate, and that would maybe some people's choices. I use facets because for a lot of people, it's not about trying to be a completely different person, but it is about maintaining very much your everyday privacy. If it wasn't for the way that search brings everything you do under a sing single name together, it would be fine to use the same names, but because everything does come together, if you ever want to ask a question in a public forum that just isn't something you necessarily want to be public, it doesn't have to be something so, shameful so or embarrassing. You are, you, just you, something different. You agree then, because there's a certain inherent tension here. You talk about the importance of history mm -hmm. in a pseudonym or a data portrait. Right. I would agree with that, and I think most people would agree that history is important even if you're faking it like gay girl from Damascus. You have in Europe explicitly the assertion of a legal right to forget or to obliterate, or for those of us who read 1984, the memory hole exists. You can put it down. Do you think going forward that law is going to be good for the issues that you're championing here? Or do you think it will lead to a further corruption of identity and authenticity? I think that law highlights the things that people want, which is control over their identity. But among other things, I think it's technological. I don't, whether it's good or bad, I don't think it's very workable. I mean, what it does is it doesn't say that the information is going to disappear, and I don't think it should. It says that Google needs to remove it from their front page. Um, it doesn't say other search engines have to get rid of it. It doesn't say that it, another, that's, that, but, that, that's the logical. Right, but I mean, what I'm saying is that people, if you want to have that kind of control over information, it, do, it shouldn't be because you said, this is something that happened in history and now we're trying to erase it. It might be that to the extent that you can do so, you might want to keep these pieces separate. Part of the issue with what's been done with Google is people are asking to have information that's very much part of the public record, expunged from right. it. So it's like you committed a crime, it was in the headlines, you would now wish that that sort of hadn't been happened in Google. <laughs> Since it didn't happen, you can make it go away. Here we're talking about just people having more control over what they say in this very public space. So Judith, I have, a, I have a question. I think this is happening in many places 
in our whole society and other places on the net as well. For example, with Pandora, I find that if I don't like the way a Pandora station is gone, I'll just make a new one. And I find with my identities online, if I go to a website and I don't, and I want to be anonymous, I make up a new identity, I make up a new email address, and it's like disposable. I, I think that there's a trend towards us creating disposable identities. Do you see that? And yeah, well where is that going? Well, that's why I think history is important. Interfaces that maintain a history are, are really important because when people have completely disposable identities and they think of them as disposable, they are not necessarily as inclined to, to try and make that identity be something that has a high Do we have a right to disposable identities? Let me just answer her question okay. first. Okay. Right. So, um, but the thing is, if you, for instance, let's think of like a discussion, like a newspaper discussion space, where if you have a history there, even if it's not under your name, I want to I want to see who's been there for a long time. A lot of times I, I love reading the New York Times and reading the comments. I much prefer reading it online because I read the some stories I only read the comments. But if a story, a particularly controversial story, comes in and suddenly there's like this raft of like ultra right wing comments, ultra right wing, ultra religious comments, and I think some of these don't all sound like the usual readers of the New York Times. I mean, maybe they are, maybe, but it sounds like somebody somewhere just went to an entire congregation and said, you need to write in, everyone go write in right now and have, say this article about the essential research is wrong. So, but I don't know, maybe that's my suspicion, but if I could see how long someone had had that identity and had been commenting there, and what other things they had commented on, I would have a sense of what their role was in the community that is the New York Times. And so the history, and then if you start to see that people have disposal have very brief ones, you might give them a little less credit. Over time, you give them a little bit more credit as they build it up. So I don't think the issue is to say that it's a right or not a right, but if you bring in history, then you let it emerge more organically that there's a lot of value to not be disposable. <coughs> so uh, I think there's a counter trend to what she's talking about, mm -hmm. and both are going on at the same time. I've been hearing people more and more, ordinary people like me, talking about their brand. Mm -hmm. uh, as if, well, I, I guess I have a brand. What, and uh, you probably have visualization and portrait software that could tell me what my brand is mm -hmm. that I've created probably without really knowing what brand I've created for myself. And at, uh, at the same time, um, it's fragmented because as you say, uh, my brand in my uh, job as a lawyer is, is probably different and I want it to be different and I want to be um, working actively and knowledgeably about my brand, but when I'm pasting my impulses on Facebook, I'm not particularly thinking about my brand as a lawyer, yet somehow all of these paths cross, and I'm probably creating a brand that I'm not even aware I'm creating. And so now I'm asking myself, well, to what extent does it matter? Well, it, does it well, and will it matter yeah. more as time goes on? I think so, especially if you look at the number of stories there are about people who get fired from their job because the job said, you know, part of, you know, when you, it's one thing to be represent your company on company time, but in a world of social media, you represent your company 24 hours. You are always on company time. And so for the people who've been fired because they made some kind of comment that wasn't, becoming to them as that brand, as a employee of this company, what it means is that you have a large population of people who really are cons highly constrained in the extent that they can participate in any kind of If only they had a disposable identity, they could have Or a separate one. It doesn't have to be disposable, but a, but a separate one. Separate. I think well, it's really important well, because- No, 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 separate, separate increases. The, the, this is where the two questions link. History creates an opportunity for the kind of inference one finds from many of the social graph techniques and social network techniques that, that Judith's book elaborates on in great detail and quite well. So this is a real 
what, what you're identifying is it's a, it's a real issue that, that, that you're identifying. I think I need the fragmented or separate identity in order to protect you, the brand you, that I'm. You may have to, to move to Europe to do that. <laughs> uh, so uh, su switching the tone a little bit. Um, so if we move away from people deliberately fragmenting and we move away from people building brands, I understand those are those are legitimate issues. Um, you said something very evocative at the beginning. You said, there is Judith at my gym, and there's Judith, you know, who is the parent of my kid at school, and there's Judith who, of course, is at Berkman Institute. And so somehow I get the feeling that some, a utility like Google has not yet evolved to where it could potentially be in that I'm not able yet to use Google to say, you know, when I do a search for Judith, and we're both parent, we are both parents of the of k different kids at the same school. Shouldn't there be this intelligent inference that I'm probably not interested in her scholarly works at first cut, unless I say I am, because in real life, if I want to talk to Judith, who I have this relationship with, I want to find out about this part of her, of her multiple identities that is relevant to me, and yet. Somehow the tools we have don't serve the purposes that your real life outside of computers actually does very well. So it's like somehow we, we're not yet where we want to be in terms of human-centered interaction with each other. So are you asking what it would take for Google to be able to give you a, an answer about a person? Or whether, you, or whether you envision an evolution where our online tools begin to serve us in ways that are more about how humans actually live their lives in reality, as opposed to some, you know, some flattening that seems to be causing tension. Right. So the reason I, I just brought this up is this was a, another piece that um, some students and I did is actually part of the a big installation that the cover picture from the book is part of, and um, it's interesting. The other slide I have that I use this one is uses you as the oh, example, but cool. that's not the one I happen to have here. So what this was was a piece where you could, you could it's actually still online, it's personas.mit.media.mit.edu. You type your name in, and the idea is it's going to give you a portrait of yourself, and it uses a lot of natural language technology, <coughs> and it does a huge search on you, and it figures out what topics you're interested in, and it, it does exactly the kind of division that Ken is talking about. but. And people find it fascinating. They love it. And it sort of comes up and you know, it says, and it sort of highlights the big areas that really characterize you and it uses color to show it. But it was actually meant to be a critique of our faith in technologies being able to do this because if your name is Ken Smith, it's going to conflate you with every Ken Smith that's out there. And it's not going to be using humor. It's, there's an enormous number of ways that we separate people out. But because you get this answer back, it's like it's like giving people their fortune based on their birth date. It has that sort of astrological feel. Because every time people run it, they look at it, and they tell me, it's so insightful. And it's so <laughs> great that it does this. And it's actually a fairly dumb program. But when you're told <laughs> how, you know, when you're told, oh yeah, these are the categories, education and law, that are characterize you. So the way that you read your horoscope, and you're saying, yeah, that really makes a lot of sense. So a lot of it is, <coughs> we, we, it, is how it's presented will tell us how insightful it seems. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of curious, your thoughts, and if you're aware of people working in this direction. I only had to work for a physicist who, who thought you look at limiting cases to understand things. And to me, when you look at privacy, big data, sensor data, all that stuff, you know, it says eventually privacy is dead and everything you've ever done is known, which sort of suggests that everybody has their warts and skeletons in their closet and eventually people are just going to accept that everyone has this. And so your identity becomes sort of a more forgiving kind of thing that people would just look at what matters and ignore things. And do you see it moving that way? Do you see people, you know, sort of adapting in that direction? I mean, that's, that, that's the very idealistic model. So, I mean, the idea there is that if everyone's history and warts come out of the closet, um, people will just become more accepting. 
and it, the more that we know about each other, the more it's starting to go. I think you, you do see little pieces of that. You know, I think there's elements on Facebook where people tend to talk a little bit too much about themselves or their breakfast. Now we know a lot of little bits of weird habits about people. At first, really intriguing, and then okay, so you know this. But you know, I think that would be nice if that was true, but I don't think it always is. Yeah. I think people, and part of it is that people are always somewhat judgmental. We are fairly hardwired to see people as in-groups and out-groups. And so a lot of this is really about what level of control you want over it. And then the, another aspect is that there's the, the social privacy of what other people see of you. And then there's privacy from, for instance, institutions. So it doesn't really look like employers have gotten more forgiving about indiscretions. It doesn't necessarily look like well, insurers. Well, the opposite case, as we just yeah. heard. Yes. Yeah, insurers are not becoming more forgiving about things. They're just <coughs> becoming more risk averse. So it depends on you know, who you're worried about looking at it. Uh, uh, just to depend on that, some of the work that I do with organizations on this, some of the experimental design work I do with organizations, particularly in the realm of loyalty and frequent users, um, particularly for elite groups, if you are a member of certain airlines or certain hotels, frequent whatever programs, um, and you call in your mobile phone, odds are they know what kind of complainer you are. There are now contact centers where if you have a reputation for being a jerk, deal with, you will go to a special kind of <laughs> human. It's not funny. Those people are very specially trained no, to deal with, with those, those I, kind of things. I think it's fantastic. I think I get sent there. <laughs> <laughs> that's why, I, I think that's why so, I'm laughing. Right. You know, so, 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 the notion, right, yeah. so the whole notion of sorting and matching based on prior history, <laughs> you know, and, and, and this is why some people come in under, you know, lock call filter. You know, there's a real difference. But if, you, if, you look, if, you, if, if you have that program in an airline or hotel where they know your number, you're, if, if, you're ever, if you've ever wondered whether your history pops up, yes, it does. The exception is American Express because they're trying to reconcile old systems. It's, 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 it's a very, very weird thing. Uh, in the back. Uh, so much of what you've talked about it, but I know that beautiful portraitures and visualizations from what is really crude data. And I'm curious, uh, after doing this for so many years, if you have a perspective on uh, what sort of digital evolution we might need to be able to have the type of <coughs> rich uh, personal presence online versus the incredibly crude and limited form of online representation that we have now, which is just streams of pictures and streams of text and the occasional wine six second video? Um, okay, so a lot of it, yeah, as, as Dana points out, is that these are visualizations of text discussions. Um, I'm kind of a fan of text discussion. I think it, it works really well for the types of input devices that we have now. Um, and but that the archive of it doesn't work very well, and hence all these visualizations. So the question is really, what what are the future of how we interact? And you know, I think um, part of it is over the years we've gone from screens that were this big to this big to now you know it's amazing when you walk around like everyone's social life exists in a very very <laughs> tiny sphere and if you look at sort of a lot of neurological research you know there's a lot of things where people say you know if you want to feel better like sit up take a deep breath you know sort of how you stand how you act like whether you're smiling if there's a lot of feedback to it when you think about that this may not be the right posture <laughs> to interact with other humans in. so i think there's there's a lot of different levels i think the, simply the input devices have to change, and that um, text is very valuable, and I think it will be with us for a very long time. I think probably the most, for me, the most exciting new interfaces would be better ways of handling voice, because that's really the easiest way for us to communicate, but it, it's very linear, it, you know, 
I think one of the things that we've all learned from new technologies and email is that nobody ever wants to listen to voicemail again. You know, it just goes on long, it's really tedious. So I think understanding how to use voice, how to chop voice up, how to make voice into sort of quick objects that you could deal with in an interactive way would be a really what, interesting. What, what's going on in innovations that really gets you excited or curious right now? That you say, geez, you know, this is what students, this is what entrepreneurs should really be looking at for the next generation of, of facilitating social interaction. Um, I think thinking about how to augment space is a big part of it. How to have information that's in spaces, how to have information on walls. Um, I mean, part of it that's interesting is aside from, the, like if you landed here from 60 years ago, the one kind of visceral change you would see of all this amazing technology and network is the fact that, yes, everyone's walking around looking at a little thing. But you know, if, you, if you sort of landed in a city you know, if you'd been locked up somewhere and you landed there after electricity was invented, you would see a massive transformation. You're not really seeing the information around us. And part of the issue with not having information be, whether it's through augmented things like Google Glass or things that are broadcast, is that none of it is shared. I mean, there's, in another talk I gave, I sort of contrast a slide of looking at commuters on a train from 20 years ago when you could see what everyone was reading. It was public that what you are reading wasn't a private thing. Now, if you lean over and say, "Oh, what are you reading there?" It would be a horrible position. So there's just a lot of display of who we so, are. So, Kindle should display the title of the book on the back. I think they should. I would have suggested it, but I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, people like to show off their music and their books. The fact that this has all become secretive is I think, silly. But I think in a, in a lot of spaces. Would you seriously? Would you recommend that as an option for, for Amazon? Is this the kind of thing that you would encourage the Samsungs and the Apples? Give people a public option to socialize the physical object. Yes. Yeah. The products like that. Would, yeah. So that's certainly a suggestion. But I think things that are also vis visually shareable, where you can see things on a wall, things like that, I think are the future. So. How quickly is, uh, are things like Google search going to move from being um, word searches to a more serious natural language search? I mean, for example, if I start studying Karl Marx, I'm studying Karl Marx. That doesn't mean I'm a Marxist. Right. Um, as it stands, I will turn up you know, in, in, the, you know, in the Marxist group, which I really don't want to be. Well. I mean, that has a lot to do also, uh, partly how much information, other information there is. The more context they have, the better it could be. If the only thing that exists about you online is that you are reading Karl Marx, it's going to be the most salient fact. So it's less an is issue, I think, with Google search and with how much information. So that gets back to that history piece is how well-rounded is the portrait of you based on your information. But it's certainly true. The only thing I know is Karl Marx. So even without Google, I would think that's okay. That's the one thing I know, and that's that's the only thing I know about you. So that's my main impression until you say something else. And don't Google Stalin afterwards. You went through a timeline of how things evolved over time. You thought how uh, people's behavior, specific people's behavior. Cohort analysis about that changes over time or how behavior in terms of the identity people show on the web um, changes by demographics, specifically age or, or geography? Um, I don't look personally at how it, it, it changes up with people's age or demographics because, again, that can a lot of factors can influence that. Most of what I talk about, and there's quite a bit in my book, is about how the technology changes how people behave. And so that was sort of the point of doing that timeline, was to give sort of a quick glimpse at that, that structure of, you know, given, given anonymity, how do people behave, given particular constraints, given particular types of interfaces. People come into all of these with very different personalities. There are people who are outgoing. There are people who are inherently quite honest. There are people who are sort of sleazy. You know, given the same interface, they'll act a little differently, but you can also still look at the overall impact of the technology. But, the, but there's something that, that your book stresses that I encourage you to discuss a, a little bit more here. Because we're talking about who are you on the web and what's your identity. 
but really the first half of Judith's book talks about social networks and your identity in a community or relationship context. And you mentioned Irving Goffman, the representation of self in everyday in everyday life. And self is his big thesis that self is a function of context. And so what insight, I mean, you, you, you showed that graph of the various aspects or your word facets of, 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 of Judith. How, how do you strike, or it's like the Heisenberg principle. You, if you measure somebody's individuality, you lose the ability to measure their community. The more you measure the community, the blurrier the individuality, the, the identity becomes. How do you strike a balance in design of identity in the context of the different communities Communities are as dynamic as right. identity. So when when I started doing a lot of this visualization work, a lot of like the sort of big vision that I had, which we are still very very far from, was something that would be sort of a whole multi-scale version of this, where you would be able to at one end see like an entire world of like all these different communities. It was sort of the landscape view that would give you this overview of how do all these different groups online. How do they interact? And then, you know, if you've ever looked at, you know, if you think about filmmaking or photography, that's like the big establishing shot. How do big pieces relate? And then there's, you know, in film you have the medium shot, which is about conversation, and that's really set, you, you sort of, you frame it so that you see two people so that one person is acting in some way. And there, you're not interested in the big picture, but you're interested in the reactions. One person acts, another person responds in some way. You might have like a group of four or two, right. but it's really about the rhythms of reaction. And then there's the portrait shot or the close up. Right. There's the master that, shot, right. there's the setting. <coughs> and there's like the individual. And there you really want to get a sense of who that person is, what their character is like, you know, what, what's that sort of impression that they give you, and how you integrate all of those is, you know, is still. I think for me, in this work, still like this big so, goal. So, so what you're saying is what you really want to do is direct. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, the gentleman who did the, the, the segmentation tool and then the lady behind it. Great. So, I thought it was interesting to look at uh, all of your early examples in those communities. The communities themselves were effectively private. And what I mean is, there wasn't a sense of some other observing or surveilling that community. But the world that we live in now online, I think, is becoming more and more aware that all of our interactions are actually being surveilled, whether it's by Google or Facebook or the NSA or all of the above. And with as we become more aware that they're sharing data and that there's all of this sort of unauthorized or unaware um, profiling going on, have you done any looking into that phenomenon and how it is beginning to <coughs> real, real impact these issues of identity and participation in communities online? Well, yes. I mean, I think there's also there's different levels of privacy that we want. And I think part of what I've been focused on here has been the sort of social everyday privacy. The issues you talk about about surveillance that's sort of the, the end of the talk that I sort of skipped to, to keep us on a sort of timely piece are tremendous. And I think doing this type of pseudonym will not protect you from the NSA, but it'll protect you at that sort of everyday, social, casual level. I think the particularly disturbing piece, I don't need to bring up the picture, but this was how the, my talk was going to end, was that maintaining these different facets online may become our one <coughs> refuge of privacy because we're rapidly moving into a world where the type of search that you have on your real name online now is going to be attached to your face. And you know, if you look outside, there's security cameras everywhere. There's photographs taken of you everywhere. You're, you really are tra certainly tracked everywhere online, but you're increasingly tracked everywhere in physical space. And it's much harder to have a pseudonymous face than it is to have a pseudonymous name. And so face recognition is getting very, very good. Um, and so I think- So Facebook was a really good name. It was a great name, yes. And so I think the, the question is that we're moving into a world where there will be records of what you do everywhere. And part of it is how much of this, is this all going to be a giant record that's within the NSA? 
Is this going to move into much more sort of <coughs> commercial spaces? Is it something we will see of, of you know, each other all the time? And I think that's very, very hard to predict what sort of society we will be like in 20 years. But I think that type of surveillance has a huge impact. I think people behave very, very differently when they feel like they're being watched. And there's enormous amounts of evidence that even hints of that will make people constrain themselves. So I think in some ways the worst impact of that is sort of the voluntary constraint. I mean, I think most of you are familiar with the notion of the panopticon, but this is Jeremy Bentham's notion that you could build a, a prison system where, and several prisons were built this way, where you have a control tower in the middle and you have a guard, and the prisoners know that the guard could be watching at any point. He may not be watching them at any given point, but because they can't see him, they always have to behave as if they're watched. It turned out that when Snowden's revelations f were first came out, one of the measurable effects wa was that all kinds of searches that people worried would get them undue attention from the CIA dropped. So people stopped searching things that would, you would think because of the book of, of the his, um, like revelations. Yeah. <laughs> but people would suddenly think, oh, I shouldn't search this because I'm being watched. I have to constrain my behavior. So it's a, it's a tremendous issue. The lady behind? Yeah, so related to that question, um, do you think that humanity or society as a whole will start to, to get better, quote unquote, because everyone, you know, they want to present themselves in a positive light in social media and public and social interactions, have to reflect that in order to share those behaviors? Um, do you think that will become a uh, reality soon? And, and just a second question, what, what responsibility and role do companies and advertisers play in promoting or encouraging us to, to share our online identities? Um, there's a recent study that showed that you know Instagram is leading girls to have you know tremendously low self-esteem, they're going out and getting plastic surgery, you know, does Instagram have an ethical responsibility in trying to help people identify themselves online in certain ways? Those are two really good, difficult questions. Um, I'll try and maintain focus on each of them. So the first one was um, about whether we're moving into a better society. And a lot of this sort of like, how do you define better? Um, because, for instance, if you have a society, for instance, all of those prisoners in the panopticon were behaving better. Um, so if, you're, uh, if you feel like you're under constant surveillance, and really bad things are going to happen to you if you behave really badly, you will behave better. At some point, we consider this extremely constraining. But at some point, you need some level of it. That's why we've all, we found out that like on anonymity online doesn't work. When people feel unconstrained, an awful lot of them behave quite poorly. It's, uh, it's about You, end up, you end up with more bad behavior than whistleblowers. Yeah. So, but you don't want to have no whistleblowers. Right. You don't want to have nobody. You don't want to give people very little freedom. So an, an enormous amount of it is figuring out where as a society we want to be in this line between a wholly constrained society where everyone is very, very nice and nobody is free at all, and one that's full of people behaving really badly and cruelly towards each other. Um, and that's you know, when I talked in the beginning about how it's a wholly designed world, the thing that's kind of fascinating online is that you you know you really can build a different interface and try these things out. It's still creatable to do that. Your second question about Instagram and brands and self-image is you know that's a whole other piece because part of it is really about how do we react to things and the unexpected consequences of a lot of everyday behavior. So one one piece I don't think. I don't think it's necessarily Instagram's responsibility, but I think it's our responsibility as a society to deal with things. So for instance, it turns out that lots of people feel really badly when you go online and you see everyone else's great vacation photos, because everybody else's family is really, really happy. Everyone else went to a really, really nice place. You know, Everyone else had a really good time, and your vacation experience, as if you even got to go on vacation, were nothing like that. You, know, you and your spouse were <coughs> speaking to each other, and it was really horrible, and 
and then you think, well, I can't post it this way, but you find that photograph that looks better, and you put it online, and you forget that now everyone else is feeling really horrible, because you post what looks like this like <laughs> fabulous time, where it's like you getting a manicure, and the reason you're getting a manicure is not your family was speaking to you, so you know, often did that. So, you know, there's all kinds of unforeseen consequences of how these particular, of what, what kind of mores develop, and so part of it is talking about these things. It's the more aware people are of it, that helps a lot. You know, if you have, I have a daughter who lives on Instagram, so a lot of it is talking to kids about these things. And where, would, where would you disagree with you in this discussion of identity and privacy? She, she's on Instagram and she's happy making her life, to use an old media metaphor, an open book, or, or not? Does, does she have a generational difference looking at these questions from you? She's probably much more private than I am. I mean, for, it's an Instagram that's, you know, it's a closed group. I mean, they okay. get a lot of people, but it's a closed group of people who can see what she does. She's very aware of all of them. And what she, do, what she posts are very staged photographs. <laughs> Though, on the other hand, that maybe part of it is that she does see a world where everyone is fairly staged. So it's a somewhat artificial space. I don't know to what extent her self-image is built up around that. I'm concerned more in a different way that you have a whole generation that's growing up with judging the merit of what they're doing with how liked it is. So like if you say that, you know, if you say this witty thing, if you post this photograph, you know, who likes this, who doesn't like this, what are the things I need to do to get more likes? So but I don't think that's the responsibility of the technology. We'll have two quick say. two more quick questions. Well, I was just going to comment that my impression of this is that it, what you said, it's a chilling effect and it's a dumbing down, you know, and I'll take, uh, I gave a talk about this recently, sometimes the unpopular ideas are the ones that are the revelations, like take Galileo, for example, you know, he was excommunicated because he contradicted the orthodoxy of the church, right, so if he wanted to, if he was chilled and said, oh yeah, the earth really is flat and everything revolves around the earth, even though he knew better, right? Uh, where would we be today? And so that's where I think the danger really lies going forward, because if you're afraid that you're going to say something that people aren't going to like it, even though it's true, then where, where do we stand? This ties well, into on, a, on a somewhat more optimistic note, well, the, <laughs> about the chilling effects, et cetera, I mean, the amount of information and opinions and ideas that are available to us to read at any point now is just extraordinary. You know, so, I mean, 25 years ago, <coughs> you just couldn't read manifestos from every single possible perspective. Those are all out there now. I mean, the love, the quantity of discussion and argument and information that's out there is just mind-blowing. So, <laughs> while I think we need to worry about this, I don't think we should be jumping to the conclusion that we're living in a world. Yes, if you spend all of your time just looking at Instagram, it's a fairly narrow piece. But if you look at the amount of information that's at your fingertips, it's <coughs> extraordinary. So. Uh, that's coming? Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to take your timeline of all the different slides you gave during right. the presentation. They were all in the past, what's mm -hmm. happened. So given everything we've been talking about, if you were to add a final slide, that said, here's where I see things five years from now. What do you think this social world will look like, given everything we've talked about? I, I think the key things to be thinking about are the move of a lot of these, yeah, and it is, as I said, it is the final slide that I didn't get to, but I think the move of a lot of these phenomena into our face-to-face -face life, that a lot of this stuff, when you know, I started this timeline, it was a world that really just existed on a computer that you had to go to a separate building to, to be on. And it's moved into your, your bedroom, the computer, and then it's on your phone. And I think increasingly as facial recognition becomes more ubiquitous, as, you know, as the phone and the um, handheld technologies become more and more easy to use, it's the, cons it's the complete um, integration of this sort of constantly on worldwide communication into our everyday physical life. So the integration and, of physical and virtual. Yeah, is I think the, the piece that's going to be the most radical in the next five years. And I think it'll be much more integrated than it is now. Can I just have a follow up one? So, so how do you see the trade off between, I synthesize kind of the things we've been talking about. One is discovery, 
which is what I think you were talking about, how you're discovered online and what parts of you you want discovered. And the other big theme has been what you're willing to divulge and under which identity are you willing to give it. Mm -hmm. So will your willingness to have multiple identities increase down the road? Will the discovery of your identity and the way you can use search engines evolve so you can actually do that? Or will we have what we have today, which is kind of like this mess? I mean, I, as a prediction, I think it will be increasingly difficult to have separate identities. I think much more will be centered on your real self and on your face, and I think it will be increasingly difficult. As a designer who wants to talk about where I think we ought to go, I'm very interested in pseudonymity and the ability to build up multiple identities that are separate. And I think particularly for online discussion, as more and more gets agglomerated into these based on your real world self, your face, identity, I think there is a lot of importance to maintaining the space for saying there should be discussions. There should be things like the New York Times, for instance, should give people this opportunity <coughs> to speak as a not their real name self. That um, giving people a sense of why that's something important they should fight for is my proselytizing side, not my predicting side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's clear that, that plastic surgery has a great future. <laughs> 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 I want to thank her for sharing with us, and we have a reception. Yes. Yes.